also like to say a, a brief plug for CNW, who does so much for our communications needs. I really do appreciate that. Our goal at CJF is to uh, provoke and celebrate excellence in journalism. And I think more than ever before, we need those pushes because of what's been happening in the newsrooms of the country. Uh, that's also why we mount this series of J Talks. Uh, it's, it's the reason we find uh, the only two Canadian websites that are devoted exclusively to journalism news and analysis, JSource in English and ProJG in French. And we're very proud uh, to be the funders of that and, and to continue our funding uh, along with the universities, the journalism schools of Canada, who are our partners in those efforts. Uh, speaking of excellence, we are fortunate tonight to have in our mo as our moderator one of the country's leading visual arts journalists. Uh, Sarah Angel is a Trudeau doctoral scholar in the Department of Art at the U of T. She's written at McLean's, Canadian Art, The Walrus, and Golden Mail. She's been an editor at Saturday Night, a columnist for the National Post, and was editor-in-chief of Sean Lane. Her academic work has appeared in several scholarly journals. She's also lectured at Harvard, the ROM, the AGO. She is, if I may say so, a true angel of the arts. Sarah? Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Nada and Demo, And thank you to the Canadian Journalism Foundation. It's a real privilege to be here this evening in such fantastic company. And uh, so I have with me here, and Brandy, who is the chief leader for the New York Times, Robert Cushman, who is the senior critic for the National Post Office, and Peter Feldell, who is the art critic for the New Yorker magazine. And welcome. Thank you all for coming this evening. Before we get to the topic of whether these men are in fact gender walking, uh, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to uh, cast uh, your attention back some years, and if you could tell the audience, you know, what was it that got you down the road of cultural criticism? How did you get yourselves into this precarious situation? And if each of you could fill us in a bit on your background and how you ended up going down this road. Uh, you're all doing different sort of writing well I, I think I speak for all of us we were we were born in coffins um, <laughs> <laughs> we were actually born dead and, and kind of pushed into the zombie life <laughs> <laughs> that, that feels feels kind of thrilling sometimes I journalism for me is a path of least resistance I came from a family of journalists my first passion really uh, you know aside from uh, theater. I loved theater from the very beginning. I uh, grew up on the edge of a university campus where when I was a kid, I was in it. So the whole thing was not at least me. I liked reading more and I read a lot better than I had to. So, flash forward, after college, I wind up in New York and interviewed John Fairchild, who's the editor of Women's Wear Daily in those days, and said, if you've got any job in the world, what would it be? And I said, uh, Chief Theater Director of New York. Well, that was about 20 years before I became the chief theater critic for the New York Times. In the meantime, I was a, in probably a fashion critic, about which I knew nothing out of New York. Paris. Um, went to work for Tina Brown, first at Vanity Fair, then the New York Hall. At that time, I was doing movie reviews, but I was going to the theater all the time in New York and in London. Not so much drunk, but I was doing theater capitalists. And, um, at one point, and I mean, ultimately, so much of it is about being in the right place, knowing the right people. My first film editor at L was a woman named Alice Mitchell, who subsequently married Frank Rich, who liked my reviews, and when they were looking for a new second screen critic, said, Do you mind if we throw your, your name? <laughs> and Robert? I've been dead person with a million But I started in much the same way. In that I was uh, obsessed by the theater at a very early age. Um, staying in plays. The children were really the age of seven, seeing a children's television production of the Wilson and Green, and BBC television. And 
sweatshirt and shy boy in the sex chamber. <laughs> the last line was, no one knows. But then I got into New York, and the poetry scene, the Lower East Side, uh, or, um, and which was then in the early 60s, in the 60s, for a sense of the art scene. And I went to Paris for a year as a starving poet, uh, because I was in the Midwest and we knew where the Paris was where it was at. You know, but being in the Midwest, that meant we, our information was roughly 25 years out of date. <laughs> 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 it was, I had been in, in, in Europe, I fell in love with art through the series of the Tiffany, including the Renaissance stuff in Italy, but then the final one was the Andy Warhol flower painting in Paris. Long well, City, you know, back in New York. So uh, I did. And like all the poets did then, I started writing art criticism for art news. Uh, I never took an art course in my life. That, that's, that's, a, that's a crucial strategic strategy you might want to try. Uh, and it was, uh, it was about 48 years ago. And um, and there's a lot in between, but um, uh, you know, for, and I educated myself in public, which is an extremely painful way to learn. And, you remember every single lesson in it. And um, uh, I like to say, everything I know about art, I learned on a deadline. But there's been a lot of deadlines in 48 years. And um, eventually, uh, I was writing The Voice in the 90s and got a call from The New Yorker and said, yes. So um, here I am. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. Um, we're talking about cultural criticism tonight. And something that I think we should address sort of off the bat is, is, is what does that mean exactly? The, the great University of Toronto literary scholar Northrop Frye in his book of essays, uh, Anatomy of Criticism, makes a distinction between criticism and personal taste. And now we're living in an age where a 140 character tweet is being called both criticism and sometimes a review. And anybody who can type is being called a critic or calling themselves a critic. And I'm curious to know from each of you, do you feel that you are right? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a cultural critic in this day and age in your field? Um, I mean, what alarmed me most when the web uh, assumed the ascendancy it has and will continue to assume is that, do you remember did you all have slam books in junior high school? There were these spiral notebooks that were passed around, and you could write anonymously what you thought of everyone in the class. Uh, and there would be clever questions like, what color is Mrs. Grier's teeth? You know? and, um, and to me, the web seems like one huge open slam book. I, there are people who like to you know, put their names out there and identify themselves. But the chat rooms, which is where a lot of the theater criticism goes on, it's, it's, it's anonymous stuff. And it's, I, I mean, for me, criticism is, is a matter of digestion, even though I write quickly and have to write fairly soon after I, I see what I've seen. But I still like to be able to process, to process it to some extent, to have, Peter and I were talking earlier about, have an editor who will argue not with your opinions, but with the clarity with which you express them. Things that go on the web aren't vetted, and they're also often done, and especially if it's Twittered, in haste. I mean, really, with, without forethought. I loved it. P-U. Yuck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and maybe you can come back the next day. I mean, people are always apologizing for Twitter, too. It's like, you know, conversations with your family. I'm not sure that should be the, uh, the great dialogue uh, of culture. It, New York, at least, hasn't. There's something in London called the West End Wingers that have actually that has actually developed quite a following, and um, they have a point of view. They go to things together. They've never revealed who they are, and basically, they just you know they're kind of campy. They're sort of like Joan Rivers doing fashion, but but that that that's that I kind of like the idea of when you have that sort of established identity and a point of view, just throwing anything out at any moment and. And, and especially throwing darts without considering, you know, what's in the dart and what your target is. Um, it, 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 
I do say it saddens me. It makes me nervous, though. I think we're still in frontier land. And I think eventually what's happening with the net, uh, including how you know, once people figure out how really to make money from journalism on the net, is going to change the way, the way we do things. So I think what's happening now is sort of the cauldron out of which more sp specific forms of um, criticism will emerge. Interesting. And, and, and Robert, do you see a distinction between criticism, reviewing? Where, what, how, do, how would you define your role? Well, I think I'm a critic. I'm also a reviewer. I wouldn't affix a value judgment to any of those things, like saying criticism good, reviewing bad, because they can both be done well or badly. They're purely job descriptions, I think. I've muddied that a bit, so I'd say that, um, to quote from a critic I admire a lot, who once said, criticism begins with the word because, which means you're not, you don't just say, I loved this, I hated this, you try and say why, and what it is in the work itself that elicited this response. <laughs> But even that, you're seeing through a personal prism, so there's, there's no point in pretending to objectivity. It's very interesting what you said about um, the web being anonymous, because that takes us back to a very ancient tradition. It's only very recently, um, certainly in England, which is what I have, you know, what I grew, where I grew up, that bylines for critics became established. That was true in the New York Times, too. Right. right. OK, you had, the, especially the Times in London, we had our dramatic critic. Right. Uh, and although he was just one dramatic critic among many others, and mercifully there were always a lot of other papers to contradict or, you know, or balance him, there was this feeling that you know, this was something being handed down from Olympus. And even though that wasn't the case, and nobody thought it to be, all the same, you had a feeling that's what the paper would like to think. Uh, but I mean, this this had a lot to do with the Times itself, and I imagine other papers. I don't frankly know. And did not having bylines for anything, not just not just for critics. Did they use the first person plural? Because I noticed that we was, uh, <laughs> yeah. not in any I remember, but right. I'd be surprised if they right, didn't. Right. And certain, uh, yeah. And I think going back further, you know, but Robert ben Robert Benchley, writing for the New Yorker, certainly under his own byline and with a very personal right, style, right, always used right. to say we. Right. I mean, like he said, "Oh dear, we 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 got the name of this author wrong. What must you think of us?" <laughs> 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 New Yorker was famous for we. Yeah. Uh, now, now we can do I. Um, and talk yeah. of the town. I mean, I don't know if this is the tangent we want to go on. Was of course anonymous for so many yeah. years. Well, yeah. Still, yeah. Uh, if you, the short reviews in the front of the magazine are still anonymous. Mm. And uh, uh, you always used to get the impression, uh, not so much now, but the New Yorker was all written by one person. <laughs> they, 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 they had a, an, an amazing, well, that's, amazing that's, style. That's, 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 uh, that's sort of the fantasy. That's the projection. Well, when Sean was there, I think to some extent yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's in fact, I was talking before, I mean, it's, it's a huge staff. Yep. You know, I think there's like, I think a little there's like 28 checkers at desks working all the time. Yeah. You can trust every word in this magazine. And uh, is, that, is that still the case? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. If you know. it goes into print. Huh? If it goes into print, because we yeah. were talking about... If you blog, which Peter does, or if I do at the Times, you don't get yeah. the same kind of vetting. No. I don't know if that's true no, for you when you just yeah. file online. Uh, so uh, it's just well, uh, um, I've, I've seen some things appear in print under my name that I, that I blush for yeah. and that are my mistake in the first place, but I, I wish somebody had picked them up. So I, th I think there's less editing and checking goes on than, I mean, than I could, used to. I could write Hitler wrote Coriolanus, and it might actually make it onto the web. <laughs> <laughs> There's no truth to that. A, if you were allowed to go from a real tangent, when I was writing, when I was writing for the Observer, uh, this was you know in the age before computers, we and if you were out of town uh, from I, I reviewing a play at, at Stratford and Avon, I would have to telephone my copy in, and you would have to spell out every word. And even if you did that, sometimes you got a, you, you you got a really in, um, intelligent copywriter, probably a critic, put out to past you. He said, are you sure you mean that, Mr. Cushman? I mean, <laughs> doesn't it, this is the current that play, not this one. <laughs> uh, 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 other times, they, they, would, they would ask you, they would say, you say Lawrence Olivier, they say Lawrence who, and ask you to spell it. But, um, and certain, certainly, you know, things got lost in transmission and in translation, and you would really blush or shudder when you, when you saw it in print. Uh, and I'm not sure why I, why, why I said all that. Oh, that's just, just to show that um, even in those days, there were other, other... These days, if I write something, if I put it on my computer, it's going to appear. So it's my fault. Uh, and I don't know quite how I feel about that. Um, what, what was the original question? Because I'm, well, sure I, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to ask Peter how, what you see your role as uh, an art critic as being. Well, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a genre of writing, and that it's, uh, it's not separate from writing any more than Toronto is separate from Ontario. I mean, it's, um, 
Um, why did that come to mind? Um, but I think my, you know, my inspirations have been literary. I mean, my, my heroes for critical writing are like uh, Charles Baudelaire, uh, Oscar Wilde, W. H. Auden, Frank O'Hara. Um, uh, you know, I I don't claim it as a as a form of literature, but uh, but I I write it as a form of literature. If that makes any sense, uh, and people can take it as they like. I mean, it's got to do the job. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, you're supposed to find out whether I like something or not, and I should be able to reveal that. Um, opinion is, I think, the least interesting and most obligatory thing in criticism for me. Uh, I'm getting, I'm giving, pardon? Well, what did you say was the I least think, interesting? Uh, an opinion right. is the, the least interesting and most obligatory aspect of a, of a column. Uh, I'm giving something, people something to read. I think that's true. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, and, you know, and that's with, you know, in a, for a magazine that takes tremendous care of writers, you know, and by the way, with the, all the editing and all of the fact-checking and the copy editing and the grammarian, I mean, I swear, you know, it's, it's all behind you as a writer, you know, it's like, you know, they will not, they will not let me make an unwitting, unwitting mistake, okay, <clears throat> you know. I can go out on a limb, you know, as long as, as they're clear that I'm clear that I know what I'm doing. Uh, and it's, it's a dream job. And it's, yeah, no, it's, it's very rare. I actually have my friend, uh, Jerry Salt, who writes for New York Magazine, who you really should have asked if you want to know about the internet, because he's, uh, he's got roughly the population of China on his, uh, you know, on his he, Facebook. He was also on a reality show. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, no, he's said yes to absolutely everything, you know, and uh, I've said no to most, most things. But it's, it, you throw them up in the air and they land in the same place. But uh, uh, he said, you know, there are, probably, there are probably seven or eight people in the United States making a living as an art critic, you know, and... Um, that many. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, but also, also there, there are probably dozens of people I've known who would be if they could, you know, but have ended up, but they couldn't get the plum jobs and they ended up in academe where they, they sort of deteriorate. I mean, that's what you do in academe. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but picturesquely and, you know, and everyone loves you. Um, uh, so, you know, yeah, the, by the way, it, it, I got a whole list of questions about the well, web about the web before we came here, and I thought you're inviting you know let's see, two and a half old Foyt men, uh, half being <laughs> my young friend Ben, uh, uh, you know, to talk about that. You could pull any 22 year old off the street, and they could tell you everything. You know, <laughs> I would be fascinated. Okay? I do have a, a daughter who's a, a master of it and regards me as, as a Neanderthal. But uh, you know, it, and again, it's like. You know, I mean, I came into it with a vocation, which was po poetry and literature. By the way, the poetry, uh, the poetry died. The poetry, I think the art criticism became more and more interesting and just kind of ate the poetry. And it, you know, it just felt bad. People say, oh, you're not writing poetry anymore. And I'm thinking, yeah, they're so sad because there are a few less poems for them to not read. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, so, you know, and, and I think, well, in a way, I, I, guess I, I guess I feel, without firing myself too much, I'm in a position of an artist because, you know, I, have, I do have, feel I have a vocation and I have a profession. I mean, that, and that, that's the, the anguish of artists in society is that, is that conflict, you know, and, uh, and you've got, you got to, I mean, how to, how, to, how to be professional so you can live without losing your vocation in which case you have nothing to live for, right? and, vo and vocation, which would encompass passion. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's really, really, I, I do think really care. You know, yeah. being yeah. being crazy, insane about art, you know, and about your own aesthetic experience. So, uh, uh, you know, and that and that's that's not going to happen on the web. I mean, unless uh, how do you professionalize a voice on the web? Uh, um, it, you know, it's because it's it's not only pay; it's also a certain kind of space around oh, around the. Oh, you have as much space as you want on the web. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, but I mean, oh, a, I mean a certain kind of like social, psychological space. Right. 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 Right.
And, you know, and of course, if you can't hack it, they throw tomatoes at you and you're gone. But, but uh, you know, I mean, on the web, it seems like there are a gazillion people speaking and nobody listening. So, um, well, it does, it does happen, doesn't it? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe not so much in the arts, maybe, maybe more in politics. I mean, Andrew Sullivan's blog must be one of the most important and mm -hmm. political writings mm -hmm. in the States, and it's, it's well written. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm, I agree with Peter that, um, of some, I mean, if somebody asked me what I look for in a critic, I'd say, first of all, being able to write. But uh, whether that's what most readers want, I don't know, especially as I think a lot of, a lot of readers tend to equate being able to write with agreeing with them. Oh, that's and, always true. Uh, and I think that, that's certainly true, um, you know, read, read, reading a lot of the, the, on, the online comments. Uh, not so much to arts critics. We don't get nearly as much of it, but certainly, certainly to political writers. You know, somebody, somebody is, is called. <laughs> well, that's New, <laughs> that, 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 that's New York, and it, it's rather enviable, right, I'd right. say, actually. Um, you know, well, I mean, I think this is getting off, off subject, but I mean, I think you're writing with one of the few papers um, that don't, from what I can see, feel that much pressure. Uh, um, I, I dare say they do, but I mean, you seem to have as much space as anybody uh, as ever, oh, no, and, and the arts seem to have as much space no, as ever. In the no, there's been no curtailing of it. I've never been told to express things in a certain way. Uh, I mean, the one neither have I. But I mean, you, you, but you seem to have more more space, and, and not just you personally, but the whole oh, no, no, thing. Arts seem to take. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, the only thing I was told early on was let <laughs> going back to Peter's thing about the opinion. I mean, because I would sort of take the, the side way. Who cannot, you know, who, who studied Coriolanus is not blah, blah, blah. They want to know with, before, it used to be before the jump. What did you think of it? I mean, they really do want a thumbs or thumbs up or thumbs down signal. And now it's like, let us know in the first paragraph. Um, that's, so that's changed. That's changed to some and, extent. And, and have things changed where your editors have asked you to use social media? I'm curious to know with all of you because you've, you know, been working through the transition of digital media mm -hmm. coming into play. Do you tweet? Do you blog? Do you follow your readers' comments? Do you follow other people online? Um, do are you using social media to augment? Well, your I, d I don't tweet. I have a Twitter account only because there was someone who had a Twitter account in my name who was posting dispatches in my voice, um, or what he said in my voice. It was really, darlings, you won't believe what I saw last night. <laughs> so in order to get him taken down, I had to start an account. And I have followers, but I've never posted once on it. Uh, I, that way, I think, madness lies. Uh, it's just... Because I, I can, I'm an impulsive person. I'm not an impulsive person when I sit down to write. I'm very considered. But I think if I just left a theater, I went, that was outrageous. How could they do that? Imagine tweeting that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't really as a critic because we have a preview period and reviews are embargoed until a, a, a certain date. So there's still a gentleman's agreement. I don't know how long it will hold. It's obviously under siege when everyone's you know, going to the first preview and, and filing online about, uh, about what they thought. Um, I do blog when I'm in, it's not that much different for me blogging from, from writing for the paper really, except you don't get that it is thoroughly. But when I go to London, I'll blog as often as twice a day. I'll just write about everything I've seen as I'm seeing it. And I love it. I, mean, I actually like writing on deadline. I like writing quickly. I like, express, like expressing my opinions. And I just walk a little faster when I'm crossing the tens so I can write about what I'm going to say next. And, then, and it's going in my head. And I'm able to spew it out when I sit down. One thing that we have to do is put in links uh, to when we write. So if we mention such and such a play, uh, we have to uh, click on, oh, previous productions or whatever. But they don't just want previous references to Times, uh, to Times articles. Now, this drives me crazy. I think it's hard enough to uh, command a reader's attention to begin with, to get them to read all the way from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And when suddenly you can click, you know, and see a naked picture of Lindsay Lohan, who's right. going to stay with your story? Um, it's fair, <laughs> you're off buying socks. And right, and right. So that can be exasperating. My favorite link ever was when I, uh, before Spider-Man opened, I went to a play that was next door. It was a lovely production by the Fiasco Company. Six people, no scenery. They did Cymbeline, and they made you understand everything that was going on in Cymbeline, basically using a white sheet in the trunk. So I ended by saying, psst. Ms. Tamor, I hear there's a white sale at Macy's, and I linked to an ad for a white sale at Macy's. But <laughs> that was taken down. I thought that was my one. <laughs>
And and do either of you two tweet blog? I don't, no, I was. I'm actually my paper did one, did one suggest I, I I start a blog, you know, under their auspices, and, and I said no, which rightly rightly or wrongly, but if I had done it, I don't think I'd, I'd be using it to write about theatre very much. I see. And my, uh, and I wouldn't quite see where to draw the dividing line between being a theater critic and being a gossip writer, yeah. if I was doing that. I mean, it's very tempting to be, to be, to be a gossip writer. No, it's like Jeremy Irons is sitting next to me, is all you can tweet. Yeah. Right? I mean, otherwise yeah. it's not Pretty cricket. Yeah. <laughs> now, Peter, you, t you mentioned earlier that there are about seven, seven art critics that are working in... in well, there's, there's there are a lot of... I mean, this thing is, there's always a huge number of young critics writing for the magazines, and, you know, and freelancing. And the general thing is that, you know, they're thirsting for glory, and then you reach a certain point where you've got enough glory, and you look around and notice you're starving to death, right? And then, uh, uh, and then, you know, then there's a crisis, and generally, that's, they're gone. You know, I mean, actually, when I reached that point in the 70s, I mean, I was just, uh, my wife was making a lot of money, so uh, <clears throat> that tided, tided me through. Um, um, well, I want to get. I've been I want to get to the question, uh, you know, that this evening is about, which is, is you know, well, quite just, seriously, do you feel like cultural criticism it, we're, that we're seeing less and less of it? Uh, well, I think it, no, we're seeing we're seeing tons more of it. It's it's uh, the thing is, I think it used to be uh, fairly tidy constituencies. I mean, the art world, the audience for like dance criticism, you know, and and. I mean, the art is, is a small, relatively small tent, you know, within a big tent. Theater is a big tent. Movies are a vast tent, okay? Uh, movies are, you know, actually I did write movie criticism for the Times in the 70s, and, and, but it was too weird. I mean, why was I writing about movie? You know, everybody, I, I, I did too, actually. Everybody's, everybody's yeah, a movie so. critic. Also, the movies don't have any right. problems, right. you know? It's like... Uh, you haven't seen a headline. The movies are the movies coming back, right? You know, so uh, well, I, uh, I don't think it's you know, art is art is nothing but problems. So there, yeah. there's there's something to be something to get get your teeth into. Um, yeah. But it's uh, I don't know. It just it's it's like a happening. By the way, I don't I don't want to get nostalgic for some good old days. I mean, you know, these are the good old days for a lot of you. I mean, and. Uh, uh, you know, I like what's that, the great old military acronym, SNAFU, you know, situation normal, all fucked up, which I think <laughs> probably, probably fits every historical moment, you know, for the people who have to undergo it. Do you, do you feel things are as alive as well and well and there's as much strong criticism or? Well, again, like Peter, I'm writing for, I'm ri well, I think actually the art mar uh, uh, market is certainly more um, uh, commercial than, um, than theater is these days. I think there's much greater risk. Than, um, and you don't command the kind of prices. You don't see, you know, the latest production of St. Joan, you know, brings in $100 million. It's just for one night's performance. I mean, it's. 135 million bucks for one, one little picture. Right. So it's, uh, I mean, I, it's kind of an endangered species, and New York still is a capital. Um, so. Really, I, I mean, I'm writing for the, the torchbearers, as George Kelly, a playwright, called them satirically a long time ago. Um, it's a very passionate audience, but I think it's a more limited audience. And um, I do think people like to seek out people that they can, you know, beat up on. Pinatas, which is the person who has not necessarily the most power, but the, the largest platform, the most conspicuous platform. So I feel I. Like I serve um, a, a purpose for all of the, the sadists in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in theater, no, not, uh, there hasn't, and I do think, as I said, I think we're still in frontier land as far as the web goes. And there will be web platforms that will be set up in the future where these things can be done and worked out and digested. I mean, I do think a lot of the criticism that you read just casually online, tweeted or whatever, it's, it's bulimia. I mean, it's really, it's not digesting, it's, it's taking it in and throwing it up almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think when we were talking about what criticism is, I think criticism requires digestion, even if in my case it's two hours. <laughs> but um, I, I do think you need to think to sift through. And I think you discover when you're writing and you have a little time to write more of what you think. And um, 
And I think Peter's right. It can, it, it can be an art balancing that, discovering what you think, discovering what you saw, putting it in context. Um, the other thing, ideally, about, about a critic in a job is that he or she brings some authority to it just because of exposure, of knowledge, of research. Mm -hmm. So just anyone being able to say, you know, Madonna was cuter, and you know, um, who's that girl? It's not, it's not quite the same. So I think they, I do think there's an audience. I think people are, gonna, but people. The nice thing about the web is you can find whatever you want, mm -hmm. and presumably there will always be people who want something with a little more substance too. Mm -hmm. Now, Robert, I want to. You know, it's interesting because Peter's talking about how at the New Yorker there's an enormous staff to to vet uh, and edit and make sure that really strong cultural criticism is produced. Ben, you're talking about how at the New Yorker you're you know you're really in the a, a dream job for a dream mm -hmm. audience. Something that I've, I think Canadian audiences have noticed is that um, the number of reviews are diminishing and increasingly reviews are being relegated to online space rather than print. Um, and I wonder, Robert, if you feel like um, the support for arts criticism as, is as strong here as it, as, as it was when you started out. No, it isn't. Uh, it's partly, though, to do with newspapers not being as strong. Uh, so it's, it's not just criticism that's in trouble, it's, it's uh, print journalism that's in trouble. Uh, I th and uh, I think that uh, arts writing is perhaps one of the most exposed parts of that. And yes, you can see that uh, the coverage is shrinking. I mean, uh, both in the Globe and Mail and in the National Post, what used to be the arts section is now combined with something else, be it it's combined with sports or, or there's something called arts and life in, mm -hmm. the, in, in the Globe. And uh, fewer reviews appear. I'm not conscious myself of my own reviews being uh, relegated to online, but I have less, I just write less than I used to do. I write, my columns when I write them are as long as they ever were probably, but there are fewer of them. So I, I think I'm probably covering less. Um, it's funny, when, when um, you asked, uh, I was originally asked about this subject, and it, the first thing I thought was, well, okay, there are people writing um, lots of blogs on, online, writing theater criticism in blog form or online form. Is this that very, is this that different from the way I started out writing in, in theater magazines? I mean, I mentioned plays and players. It was a time in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, when I was writing regularly for them. So it was Benedict Nightingale, who went on to become a critic of the London Times. So it was Michael Billington, who went on to become a critic of the London Guardian. Uh, and there were a few people who, quite a lot of people, who I would say, in all modesty or immodesty, were not as good as us. But um, this was regarded as being um, the path, I assume, towards the, the objective of having an actual newspaper job as a regular theater critic. And some people got it and some people didn't. And I'm wondering, is this what uh, aspiring bloggers on, on the web actually aspire to as well? And at first I thought, yes, that must be true. And then I thought, well, maybe not. No, maybe that isn't their dream because they, they don't actually see a world in which writing for newspapers is, the, is that desirable or in which there'll even be newspapers to write for. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But I, I think it is a dream, though, still for some people, that there's, whether it's a newspaper or the online equivalent, for, for being discovered and, and given that kind of, kind of forum from which to work. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in terms of, of boiling criticism down, um, there is a website uh, that I had nothing to do with it. It's not affiliated with the Times. It's called didhelikeit.com. And it has a little caricature of me talking. And its premise is that you don't have to read the reviews because they will show me either going like that, <laughs> that, or sitting on a fence. Uh, so, um, <laughs> which, I mean. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't, I mean, aren't those the only alternatives? <laughs> well, yes. I, I mean, one advantage of being an art critic is, is that uh, you are not at all in the role of a consumer reporter. Mm -hmm. which you are with every other art, you know, buy the book, the record, uh, the theater ticket, you know, go to the movie. Uh, the artwork is bought by somebody in Saudi Arabia, you know, and uh, you're, not, you're not writing for economic consumers, mm -hmm. you know, you're, write, you're writing for kibitzers, for people who are interested. You know, I, I try very hard not to say outright, I recommend this, or rush to this, or go buy tickets for you this, don't? but I do 
you know, I do understand that people will read that into it, and I don't mind them doing that, right. but I don't think I should tell them. Because I don't know about you, but I sometimes freeze up if people ask me, you know, off the record, to recommend a play to them. If they're people I don't know, because then I'm talking to their particular taste, no, and I rather get than just throwing something exactly. out and saying, "All right, make of this what you can." I get lot. I get emails. You know, my wife and I, and my husband and I, are coming to New York. What should we see? And I think, <laughs> <laughs> who are you? I mean, I have no idea. Where do you come from? I mean, do you object to a certain kind of language on the stage? Do you not like experimental theater? Uh, you have to have some kind of criteria to. Uh... And the other thing is, would I like, you know, Matilda? I just reviewed it. Click on this. <laughs> for for the line of Walter Kerr, as I once memorized, can I tell you when, um, that he's he said it's very good to go to cocktail parties. It's good for a critic's ego, or, or you know, to, to to smash his ego because somebody will come to you and say earnestly, "What did you think of such and such a play?" And here, the, the convivial fellow is only letting you know that he doesn't read you. He doesn't intend to read you, and he couldn't possibly follow the meandering as you approach if he did. The, the worst, though, is when they come, and come up and say, I so agree with you, I hated that show, and you go, no, no, that was a rave, I loved it. Where did you get that? Yeah. People do forget. I mean, that, that's the yeah. thing. There's the so-called critical reputation of a play it very, has something very little to do with what the critics actually wrote. No, it's perfume. It's sort of it's this the, kind of thing. Yeah, that, yeah, right, something right, something right, generalized right, grows right, up after right, the fact. Right, I mean, right. all the plays that are supposed to be masterpieces, you go back and the reviews are surprisingly mixed. Oh, I've edited books and reviews at the, um, uh, from the New York Times, a couple, one of plays, one of musicals. And, you know, when Oklahoma opened, they said, well, it's pretty good. You know, we like. And then, you know, two years later, everyone was saying this is the turning point in the American musical. <laughs> My favorite was uh, Brooks Atkinson's review of Streetcar Named Desire, which he liked. He said it's a good play. Jessica Tandy was very good, very important, monumental evening in the theater. Also in the cast was Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, it's great fun to be a Monday morning quarterback, but um, I'm sure there'll be many instances of, of my reviews that were like that, too. For, for the people in this room who are aspiring critics, I'd, I'd like to ask each of you, what does it take to develop a critical mind? To develop a critical mind? Peter, I, th I think you're the one to begin with that. Oh, it, uh, be very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think be very, very unhappy as a kid. And, uh, you know, and uh, be eager to find somebody to blame for it. Uh, no, I mean, a critic, a critic is someone, you know, who is just dissatisfied with the way the world is. I mean, the world is full of everything from galaxies to Starbucks cups, you know, and, and if you were happy, you'd come in. I mean, this is fine, you know, it's like, what's, what's the problem, you know, but... But a critic is, a, you know, that a, a, a critic is someone who blunders in and says, "No, you got to fix this. You know, you got to throw that out. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to celebrate this." And okay, now things are all right until five minutes later, and then nope. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a personality. I, mean, I, I, I think it's also having a, a double consciousness. Uh, there's a part of me that, I, I mean, I, people always ask, "How do you know when you, you know?" When you're, when you're watching the play, how much is it your mind that's computing, how much is it your gut? Well, they're operating simultaneously. And I could be all the way through going, well, this is interesting how this reflects this, how this clicks. But I literally check my facial muscles at some point to see if I'm smiling. And even if it's Oedipus Rex, if I'm smiling, it's working. And when you write, you want to create both sides of it. You want to be able to step back and say, it's yeah. It's a performance. Yeah. It's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's yeah. like, you know, watching your mind work and, yeah. and letting it work and, and not getting tied up in knots, or getting tied up in knots and then getting, anyway. You don't want to know. Able, you yeah, want being to able to take stuff. the knots apart uh, when you sit down yeah. and write. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the ideal. I mean, the advice, practical advice, is, is just, if you're a theater critic or a book critic, read everything you can, see everything you can. Um, Our talks stay up really late. Right. You know, you know, hang out with with people. You know, who well, know, uh, drink with them, sleep with them. Uh, you know, I have know. Uh, have not if you're a theater have critic. Have <laughs> well, no, when, when you're young, one of the things I tell, one of the things I tell. I mean, I think more the great stroke of luck for me, uh, one of the many. I mean, I've I can't believe the number of lucky. You know, it's like if life was fair, I would not be here today. I, you know. Uh, but uh, the, the first 15 years I was a critic, I was basically a nobody in New York. I mean, I, even writing for the Times, because I, mean, I was on the downtown scene, which was very heavyweight and very serious. And I was Peter the Poet. And, uh, 
you know, and nobody took me seriously. Uh, and then tell him that then after about 15 years, I decided, well, let's see how well I can do this. You know, and I, by, by degrees, I became somebody. By the way, there are millions of somebodies in New York. You know, it's like everybody's top of the heap, lots of little heaps. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, and one thing I tell kids, you know, who are, who are aspiring is say, say, you know, you have a tremendous advantage at this moment, which you don't know, which is that you're nobody. I said, you know, I know how painful that is. But that, this is the golden time of your life because no one will bother to lie to you. You will hang around. They won't, you know, they won't take you seriously enough to, to uh, modify what they say. The moment you are somebody, you will never have, hear the truth ever again from anybody. <laughs> you know, no, and, and that's appropriate. I mean, everyone is going to want to spin you, you know, as they should, you know. And, uh, you know, you're, you're not getting any more primary information anymore. And uh, you're going to have to live off what you got. So. Thank you, Peter. I'd, I'd now like to open up to questions in the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, um, Mike will come around to you. Over. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, and welcome to Toronto, gentlemen. And uh, Robert, nice to see you again. My question is, uh, this is about The Walking Dead. Do traditional critics have a future? And from what I've heard and what I suspected ahead of time, uh, that it would be print is the traditional art critics. Because I think what we're seeing uh, electronically, especially in social media, that they indeed have a future and a growing future. And uh, I think that um, I'd like you to respond to this, is what do you gentlemen do when um, the ads dry up and print. You know, we've just had the Canadian Jewish News has closed down, and uh, there will be others. Um, do you intend to go to social media? Um, or are we in a transition phase where social media will uh, develop places for experienced gentlemen like you? I mean, by social media, do you, are we talking about Twitter, Facebook? Uh, Lengthier things like uh, blogs, I would think. Oh, well, and yeah, blo no, blogs I, I do. I mean, I, I, I'm all for blogs, and I actually think it's a great testing ground, as, as we were suggesting earlier, for, for new critics, too. Um, you have to, I mean, one thing that I find a little um, uh, daunting about this age, and I don't have to brand myself now, but that's sort of the first lesson in life if you want to be a success. You brand yourself. People always talk about branding themselves. You get your name out there any way you can. You're Paris Hilton, although he's sort of over, but you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> you're um, you know, saying something obnoxious every day just to get your name out there. And um, that may actually not lead to an enduring career. It's spiritual uh, suicide. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, you talk about a dead man walking. It's like yeah. it's like uh, it's formaldehyding yourself before you know, right? Uh, at the age of twenty, um, <laughs> you know. And, and again, it's like that's that's the desperation to be somebody. You know, you know. I'm somebody. Okay, I've succeeded in becoming somebody. Who am I? I don't know anything. Right. Uh, you know, it's like um, I'm a fool. <laughs> Although, for some reason, I'm amazed, and of course, we don't have a representative of that field there, of the precocity of fashion bloggers. Yeah. I and mean, they're amazing, these 11 year olds well, we and 12 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't beat the children, you know? Because yeah. like, there's always, um, there always some more coming along. I mean, it's like, so I'm trying to think that, you know, the, the, the fame machine, it's like, it's like a, a laboratory with a, uh, a dumpster out behind, and there are all kinds of fucked up laboratory animals in it, you know, it's like the last, you know, yesterday's famous, you know, dumped out the back. Uh, anyway, so, excuse me. Uh, I thank you very much for your talk today and for your ideas. Um, uh, I uh, am a consumer of what you write, uh, but I also live in the arts world as a musician. I am the subject of... Uh, criticism, and uh, I welcome it. I read my criticisms. I've been fortunate enough to be generally well-reviewed, but the bad ones, the good bad ones, are, are worth reading. And uh, in contemplating your topic uh, today, uh, I celebrate uh, a near-zombie status for you in that the end of the papal ex-cathedra, this is good, that is bad, 
I have now made or ruined your career days, I think, are at an end. And I'm wondering if, if I could share an anecdote with you and get your reaction to it that I've just heard. Uh, it's new to me, but it's circulating in the Canadian theater circles. And I got it secondhand from somebody who heard it from the person to whom it was told. And it was from your, one of your predecessors, uh, 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 Clive Barnes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Canadians will probably remember when uh, Hosanna went to uh, the Michel Tremblay, uh, Tremblay play went to New York, and uh, the next day there was a review from Clive Barnes that began with the words, if your name is Richard Manette, do not read this review any further. And uh, uh, this classic Canadian play, uh, uh, and, and by the way, that review is on the web. Uh, if by the way, I'm sorry to contradict okay. you, but that's not true. <laughs> that, 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 that applied to Richard Manette playing Hamlet in Toronto at the age of, I think, 19. Now, I don't, know, I don't know what kind of response Hosanna got in New York, but that can't have been it. The, the Unless story, Clive Barnes was plagiarized. The, then the story I was told had cross wires. Uh, but I believe what is true about the story is that, is that Hosanna got a very bad review. It closed within two weeks, and, and it ended its New York run right away. Uh, and and uh, at a party not long before uh, uh, Mr. Barnes died, I am told, uh, the story circulating, he was asked if he had any regrets in his uh, reviewing career, and he was told, yes, there was this Canadian actor, Richard Manette, and I, he was in this play, uh, Hosanna, and I was devastated by the play, and for some reason, I went back and wrote a negative review that closed down the play. So here we have an example. If the story is true, if the story is apocryphal, it's still worth reacting to, I hope. But if the story is true, and uh, uh, I have no reason to believe it isn't, uh, we have a situation where one critic affected uh, uh, a, a major Canadian writer, a major Canadian production, a major Canadian artist. And I think those days are over, and that might be good uh, without taking away anything from the work that you do. OK, in the first, can, can, in the first place, uh, I don't think that's true anywhere, as far as theatre goes, anywhere except New York. And I don't know, Ben, 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 can, ben, 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 ben can speak to this, but there's no one critic, I think, in any city who has the power to open or close, I mean, power to close a play. Uh, I think if everybody's against it, then that obviously will have a powerful effect. And there are so many other contributing factors um, as to whether a play appeals to people or catches their fancy or not. Criticism is part of the mix and it's an important part of the mix. But I don't think, maybe it's because I've always written, I mean, I wrote in London, I wrote for The Observer, which is... Uh, was one of about uh, a dozen national papers at the time and uh, not the one with the largest circulation by any means. The National Post, I'm one of four daily papers in Toronto. So I've never had that kind of power. And I don't think I ever would have wanted it. In fact, I know I wouldn't have wanted it. I'd like to think I have some kind of influence, but not, not, not that kind of power. So I, I think you're lamenting or you're, you're celebrating the end of a situation that didn't exist, at least as far as theatre is concerned, at least as far as most places are concerned. And, and to some extent, I think the, uh, the, the fantasy of the times to make or break any show has always been a myth. Uh, there was a, a little show called Tobacco Road that not a single critic in town liked, and it went on to become the most successful shows in theatre history. Frank Rich, who was known as the butcher of Broadway and was, you know, said to, you know, leave Carnage wherever he went, he didn't like cats. I mean, <laughs> it went on and on and on. So there were always things that could slip under the radar. I think especially now with marketing, I think ever since television commercials began, but especially now with the web and the way you can look to so many different opinions, and there was always proverbial word of mouth. There were shows, and especially types of shows, that were not going to be critic pleasers, but crowd pleasers that were going to survive. I still think a little show uh, is, is more vulnerable, and it, I suppose it is possible if you got up and down and, and, and stomped on it. But you try not to use, you know, the elephant gun on the, the mosquito. I, I think that's generally cruel and unnecessary. I mean, if they're big, I mean, uh, Fiona Shaw just opened in um, The Testament of Mary Combe, Toy Beans play, directed by Deborah Warner. These are all artists I admire tremendously. I liked Combe, Toy Beans' uh, book very much. I think I would have liked to, I did read his script in advance. I liked it very much. Love Fiona Shaw, Shaw Irish actress. Love the collaboration she and Deborah Warner have done in the past. Medina, Medea, The Wasteland. 
But this was just so overproduced and so literal-minded, almost as if there was, this was the only way they thought they could just sustain the attention of a Broadway audience. And in that case, I mean, I don't go after them with a machete, but I think, you're big kids, you know, you've, you've been in this sandbox and, you know, dominated yeah. it for an awfully long time. So, so, you, so it's, it's graded like that, but... Um, well, the interesting point is, though, it, how, what, what effect has your review had on the, sh on, on, on the well, show? Well, unfortunately, that was a show that unless it got, you know, people yeah. vaulting through hoops to begin with, it wasn't ever going to have a huge audience. It was going to have a certain snob, snob audience. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it. Huh? Looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's worth seeing. I mean, but in, in art, the, the the critic is is fairly obsolete in the art world. I mean, it, the uh, the market has uh, from the from the the dealer to the collector to the you know to the auction houses to the, you know it's uh, the market is completely out of out of control and it, and is is making all those decisions. And then on the one hand, and then there are the institutions. Right. Who are you know desperate for big crowd pleasers on the other, and uh, and everything is moving really fast, and that that kind of frees you, you know, you can just say what the hell you Pete want. Peter has written, uh, I think, brilliantly on uh, both Jeff Koons and Damien Hurst pieces that are really worth looking forward to. But but it's his. I mean, what's so great about it, and it shows you know how how thoroughly he's into the. The market is it's as much about the marketplace and its role in the marketplace. Yeah, well, the market, and, the yeah, marketplace. Yeah, the marketplace yeah. is not only it's right. not only uh, judging art, uh, you know, relatively. It is uh, generating it. That, that is, a general couple of generation of artists now are working for and in this market, uh, which, by the way, is not disgraceful. I mean, this is how art happens in every generation. It's where the money comes from. You know, it's the, the pope or the king or the mm -hmm. uh, uh, or the state or the or, or a certain kind of uh, collector class. Um, uh, art follows the money. And um, so, you know, so I'm, I'm required to sort of report on that. Mm. It used and, to be, sorry. Hmm? Oh, sorry, let me interrupt you. Um, but, uh, and by the, by the way, I used, to, I used to be a big defender of the market against my, you know, <clears throat> my radical avant-garde, you know, uh, uh, anti-commercial friends. I mean, it, it, it seemed to me that the market generally made better judgments than um, than critics. Um, it's you know, it that's because you know that was, but that was when that was when money had some meaning. You know, when when even the rich people had only so much. Okay, it's like you know, I know. I mean, the, the few times the few times in my life, maybe three or four times that I've actually bought an artwork, you know, it was never very much. It's like I I had occasion to realize. That writing a check is so much more sincere than writing a review, <laughs> you know, you know? Be because because it hurts. You know, I'm getting paid for writing the review. What do I care? You know, it's like this is my money. You know? I must really like this. You know, so uh, and you know and 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 as long as the market was you know with a kind of upper middle class phenomenon, you know, it it did. You know, you you had the the you know the the self consultation of the of the buyers, you know, and you know with manipulations and, and fads and shit. But but uh, but now there is. I mean, the money is there's so much money. The people who are rich are just unimaginable yeah. amounts of money. So it's like, I mean, if if they uh, if they're if they considered an investment and you know and it collapsed overnight, but you know they'd move it they'd move the piece from the living room to the den. Okay, you know it's like. There's never going to be a panic crash in the art world because, because, you know, panic is when people desperately sell to get out before, you know, before it, it bottoms out. They don't care. People who have that much money don't care, you know, and, and it really shows. And it just, you know, it's, it's really, it's just like this surreal situation. Uh, don't get me started. <laughs> you're, but you're, you're, you're onto something else, though, which is one thing that actually does, I suppose, make the position of critic suspect, is we are separate from the audience in that we get free tickets. <laughs> and maybe, maybe our positions would change if we were actually, you know, actually in the position of having to shell out, really, actually quite a lot of money if you're talking about the West End or Broadway. Uh, but don't you think we'd be less charitable? Yes, I think we would be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we would be. Um, think, something yeah. there used to be, I don't know if it still exists. I don't think it does. A, web, a website coming out of London uh, basically grading the theatre critics. And I think it actually mainly dealt with musicals. And what they were concerned with doing was praising or damning the critics 
according to whether they reflected the views of the public. And they were damned for reflecting, they were damned if they panned shows that people went to see. Now, this struck me as fairly stupid. To begin with, um, it, it, to begin with, obviously, people were going to see the shows, and what harm are the critics doing anyway? And the number of people who were going to see the show was the only metric they were using. Secondly, they seemed to think there was this sort of this, this great monolithic thing called the public, which always thought the same thing, which obviously isn't true. A lot of people have different tastes. Just as, believe it or not, quite a lot of critics have different tastes. And also, they actually then, because the guy running the, 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 the guy um, running the site turned out to be a Stephen Sondheim fan, and then he he lamented that uh, the public didn't go to see Sondheim shows. Thereby, I, I will, I, I'm with him on that. But I would have thought he thereby torpedoed his own case. Obviously, the public wasn't always right. Hi, I have a question for Mr. Brantley, Mr. Cushman kind of specific. And by the way, I'm a great fan of Peter Sheldahl's Art's Writing. I just, The New Yorker's a great read, and you're one of the best read reasons okay. for it. But you're asking us instead. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be I, meeting later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, um, you said that you thought that the, um, the new show with, um, that you just mentioned yes. was overproduced. Do you think that's possibly a reaction to, of a director and an actor to the fact that bells and whistles seem to be required more? Absolutely, yes, oh. which I think is a problem. Which and is really I, depressing and to I think hear. it happened yeah. on Broadway again and again. But, but you do think it's a, a reaction? Oh, no question. Robert, I, I, I think Robert, there's a perception that audiences aren't willing to sit still for a performance on its own. I mean, there's a new production of Pippin that's opening. Uh, and Bob Fosse took a, a slender show to begin with and made it into something glorious through, through the choreography. He was obviously putting layers on it that perhaps weren't in the book and the songs. Well, the, this new version that's coming by Diane Paulus has Cirque du Soleil, basically. It's, it's all acrobats on top of that. So it's as if, give me more, give me more, give me more. And it's like watching the Four Ring Circus and not quite knowing where to focus. Um, but the idea is that if you get bored looking at this side of the stage, then you can switch to that one. But yeah, that was the pro that, and it shocked me that Deborah Warner and Fiona Shaw would come up with something like well, that. I haven't, I haven't seen the show. I mean, it's, it was overproduced in the physical sense. Because uh, <laughs> no, I mean, because I'm 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 a great admirer of both of them. But oh, I, I, I have known I, I I have known them to overdo things. I mean, I've known Fiona to overact, put it like that. Yes. Or to, I mean, to to well, show no, to no. show off all her amazing talents in one in in one role when it isn't called for. Right. Uh, but I don't I don't know if that's the no no. In this, it's it's. Uh, it starts off, you go into it, you walk up and, and visit a shrine on stage in which she's seated behind a glass cubicle with votive candles, and the idea is that this is the, the Mary we know, and she's going to strip away the iconography, the two of them, and then we're going to see the real person. Well, the real person is walking across the stage the entire time, toting things that look like crosses. When she talks about the corn, the crown of thorns, she puts barbed wire around her neck, she takes off her clothes. It's... For no purpose, as far well, as I can see. She once play a head of gobbler under the same director who spent much of her time pushing the furniture around right. the room. Uh, so I think <laughs> this, this might just be a matter of personal taste rather than reacting to commercial pressures. I don't know. Well, uh, I mean, did you see their happy days? Because that was big, but I didn't mind no, the I, scale I, I, of that. No, yeah. I, no, I didn't. Yeah. But, no, I mean, yeah. but I, I, I mean, this is sort of inside baseball. I didn't yeah, know if I, I continue with um, this. But, uh, <laughs> I suspect, though, I mean, that you're a director. You can tell me. You, you can tell us this. But I mean, aren't directors to a large extent um, exercising their personal their, their personal taste? And they, they they might develop a taste for spectacle as they get older and more experienced and have bigger budgets at their at their disposal. <laughs> you're up there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there is pressure from the producers. We have to keep the audience engaged. Yeah. And are they going to sit there and watch a woman in a chair tell the story of what it was like to be the mother of there Jesus? There are so many ways to go wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's like you, you, there are just, there, I mean, anyone who puts on anything or does anything is, is kind of crazy. I mean, aren't they afraid? I mean, you know, that, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, of course you have taste. I mean, it's like... Uh, and I do think people can be spoiled by larger budgets. I think. Uh, well, that's true. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I think. I mean, it. I mean, artists. You know, young artists. Uh, 
I mean, you know, the art careers, it's certainly when things are moving fast, I mean, during the time when, when it was, there was more concentration and unity in, in new art, you know, from, from, uh, from modern art into the 60s and 70s, you know, it's like uh, art would have three or four years, you know, at best, where they're really on, and then something would happen. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very brave, and, you know, and, and yeah, no, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, Actually, I don't want to take up time, but it's, when I decided I wanted to write art criticism for Art News, I called up Tom, Thomas Hess, who is this great editor and writer, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and asked if I could write, and, and he didn't know who I was, and, he, uh, and I tried to lie. I tried to make up qualifications, you know, or something, and, and I, I'm a terrible liar. So he just said, said oh, never mind all that bullshit. He said, just tell me, write me a letter telling me what makes you think uh, that you're qualified to walk into a gallery where some poor bastard has his paintings and to tell them they're no good. You know, and I think I wrote a letter saying I would never do that. You know, and of course I did. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm only visiting where someone has to live, you know, and someone has, in fact, bet, just bet the mm -hmm. farm, you know, their life on this thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, but, but they're putting it up on the big, on the big stage, they're putting it up in New York. Um, they want, they want the truth. Um, and, and, and the answer to that too is everybody who walks into that gallery is going to have an opinion of what they see, whether they express it in print or in conversation or, 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 or yeah, online or, or, or wherever. Yeah, and I, I, I know that in most cases the artist will remain blissfully ignorant of what that opinion was. Um, but I mean, I don't not now, thanks to the web. Well, that's another yeah. thing. I mean, oh, no, everybody's... everybody's <laughs> <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I do think that sets theatre reviewing and movie reviewing and performance art reviewing in general apart from art criticism and literary criticism is what we're reviewing are collaborative efforts. So when you're going around dishing out praise and blame, mm -hmm. it does help to have some idea of who is likely to have done what. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more space and consideration you have to try and bring this back to the subject we're supposed to be talking about. The more space and consideration you have, the likely you are to be able to do that justice. And I, I think a lot of the times in what, what, what I see on the web, um, if, I were, if I were involved um, as a practitioner, I, I don't think I'd have the courage to look at what people were saying online. I think I'd be more scared of that than of seeing what they're going to say in print because uh, I know it, 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 it's, it's going to be so much off the cuff and, and it's going to be anonymous. They're not going to care very much what they say and they're not going to be, have the consciousness that there are actually living, breathing human beings on the other end of what you're saying, which I think is something we ought to bear in mind, though I don't think it should inhibit us. But I think we might, we might at least have some sleepless nights. I think we might right. have the decency. To I, mean, I, don't, I honestly don't think, and I you know, think it's great that you do, I think artists should not read their criticism. I really don't. I mean, talk with the people you collaborate with. Uh, but I mean, the early in my, when my name was sort of out there, I'd, you know, I, when I'd Google myself, I'd go, oh my God, you know, and bring out the gun and the um, you know, t sleeping tablets. It's, you can find everyone hates out there. I mean, you can also find stuff to bolster your ego, but, but if you have a vision, I mean, stick to it. Uh, they'll always be, if you're involved in it commercially, they'll always be money men to tell you what they need you to do and what they want you to do. But I'm not really sure listening to critics is going to do you any good. No, no I, don't, I don't write for artists. I mean, they get yeah. to buy the magazine and read me. Uh, but uh, and that, that, that was a Rubicon, by the way, when I went from the downtown art world, where it was, you know, it was <clears throat> very clubby, and, you know, to, to actually, you know, uptown. And, and not, you know, I mean, I had tons of friends, lovers, you know, enemies who were artists, you know, until I, I started to take it seriously, and then it kind of became harder and harder. But I do think, the thing about taste, you know, I think, I think I try to, I mean, I, I try to be a little fairer than my taste. I've got this little mental test of saying, I don't like this. Okay, what would I like about this if I liked it? <laughs> you know? And, you know, and it, it's like, it's like so I slip into another taste, another mind. You know, I sort of, I sort of uh, walk the cat back. You know, it's like I, I, I uh, retrofit, you know, liking it. And if I can't, if that doesn't work, I think, 
what kind of person likes this? You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> then I go sociological, you know. Uh, Although um, I would like to say the first time I ever met Peter and we, um, we had drinks with Peter and his wife, who was my most constant theater-going companion, by the way, along with Peter, uh, I can't even remember what I said. But it was some, you know, my, it wasn't even an extreme opinion. And Peter looked across the table and said, if you feel that way, I can only pity you. <laughs> 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 He's mellowed since then. Um, and the question for Peter, um, it just relates to what you just said, I think. I don't want to be redundant, but um, I'm wondering about uh, you know, the, how rare your situation, I'm mean, thinking about how rare your situation is in terms of the um, increasing scarcity of reviews that are, um, you know, that, that contain some kind of negative content or partially mm -hmm. negative content and how, you know, that, that there's, the, you know, take a prominent example, Art Forum, that the percentage yeah. of even partially negative reviews in Art Forum um, is, is minuscule. And, and, and for the a print magazine that is the size of a damn telephone book. I mean, you right. know, with ads. I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, w would you start pissing on the people who buy those ads? I mean, I like wouldn't Vogue, if I were it? them. Yeah. Isn't art form especially as essentially the vogue of the art world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So yeah, no, it's it's uh, that's that's a success model. Yeah. No, the, do not the, do the, not be negative. Yeah. This I mean, is the, the, I thought about a great deal is that 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 the, the, the Increasing pressure to write in a mostly promotional uh -huh, uh -huh. way, yeah, uh, and how that is truly becoming extinct. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I think it's always sort of been the case. I mean, it's like, I mean, back in the old days. I mean, you know, back when the art world was small. And by the way, when I came along, there were the, there were a few galleries on Upper Madison Avenue and a few along 57th Street, and that was it. You could do the whole galleries in a day, you know, and uh, less than a day. Uh, and, and, but there, the problem was uh, pissing off the people you were going to run into every time you went out, you know. It's like, uh, by the way, I say, you know, in, 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 you can be really, there are only two cities on the continent and, boy, am I going to get in trouble here, that, you know, I think New York and Los Angeles where, where you can function comfortably as a serious art critic. Because, because in order to be a serious critic, uh, my criterion is you have to be able to make a new enemy every week and never run out of people to be your friends. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a matter of months in most places, in, in the biggest places, you know, a couple of weeks in Kansas City, all right? Uh, so, uh, uh, no, but that, that's, uh, yeah, the pressure, the pressure to please, you know, is, is, I mean, it affects all of our lives. And, and uh, you know, and I, I think great critics have, have had a streak of suicidal independence, you know, and, and uh, but that can only last so long. I mean, I, you, you, that's why there's something like the New Yorker is so precious, you know, and, and the New York Times. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, you know, serious publications, the, the editors, the medium, you know, it's like, uh, uh, anyway, I, 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 well, you tell if, if you tell me so, I'm sure you're right. But I mean, I've never ever been under any pressure from any paper to write a positive or negative review of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always thought what people complained about the critics that they were too negative all the time. It's nice to it's nice to hear the other side. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but th th there there is self censorship. I mean, there's you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, I have a sort of a uh, two-pronged question. Uh, first of all, do you th think that you're writing or for the public or for yourselves or somewhere in between? And because that's a question that comes up often, who, who are reviewers or, or arts, uh, or cultural critics actually writing for? Uh, and secondly, would you, any of the three of you consider yourselves to be members of the community in which you're operating or strictly, totally outside observers of it? 
Well, I think we're at different ends of the extreme. Um, I, I like to say that you, you, you have to be inside and outside at the same time. I mean, it's because it's, if you're too far outside, you don't know what you're talking about. And if you're too far inside, you can't tell the truth. Uh, I, I think, by the way, I think, I think the publication you write, the place you write, sort of decides the audience. You know, decides what the target audience is. You know, uh, you know, the New Yorker reader. So, you know, I have a New Yorker uh, uh, editor, you know, so that I'm making sure I address what they project as the New Yorker audience. Uh, but I write for anyone who wants to read me. Uh, I write to my own standards. And the fact that you're writing, I mean, <clears throat> posits an audience. I mean, really, I mean, and I, my journals will be burned when I die, but nonetheless, you are writing because you're making an effort to make something clear. And, and also to seduce. I mean, you want to. And wanna, very much to seduce. I mean, gotta, you want you someone jokes, to read it people, all the way to the know? end. Yeah. So, in that sense, you are, you are performing. Yeah. And you think, have I done this before? Can, will this excite people? Do I begin with a rhetorical question? I mean, all of that. Yes, you're very, you're very aware of the audience, I think. Now, I have nothing to do with the theater world. I just couldn't. I really, I w the few people I know in the theater, I won't review. Um, I went to, uh, because I, I couldn't review the opening of the new play about Bette Midler, about Sue Mingers, Bette Midler's in it, because I'd worked for Graydon Carter, who was one of the producers. So I actually went to the opening last night, and boy, was that creepy. I mean, it was like, you know, the scene in um, Casablanca when the Gestapo wa walk into Rick's cafe. <laughs> it was, I, I, I didn't stay for very long, but I, it's, <laughs> the Times in particular has a very special relationship with the theater, and whether it's perception or myth, there's still a perception of power, and I think a lot of resentment. And um, I, if, I, if you know people, you're going to take too many things into consideration that you probably shouldn't know. You know, that someone's dog just died, or... Uh, I mean, I don't think we need to know these things going into it. I don't think we should. We'd be nicer people, maybe, if we did, but I, I don't think you can do that. Ben, thank you. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Robert, thank you. I'd like to welcome Nada to the podium. I want to thank our panel, and I want to thank you all for coming. Please join us now for uh, reception and our gallery space where you can meet and mingle. Thank you.